500 years separate us from Hieronymus Bosch, looking at the paintings of which we have plenty of questions to ask. What is all of this about? What did Bosch mean to say? What are these creatures? Pure imagination of an insane artist or heresy? Was he under some kind of influence when creating the paintings? How could he possibly come up with something like that? Luckily, we can answer most of the questions, but one step at a time. Bosch lived at the turn of the 15th and 16th centuries, a truly breaking point. Medieval men used to live in an understandable, linear world, attended churches, prayed, and entrusted their whole existence to the priests. But things changed overnight. In the 14th century, plague mowed down a third of the European population, which was not the worst thing coming. The worst was that priests and monks died too, just like the sinners and peasants. Everyone expected them to avoid God's punishment. Among many other reasons, it triggered the flourishing of the medieval religious cults trying to find a true path to God and restoring the cults' shared belief that they are on the right way. The situation got worse when the Book of Revelation by St. John became a bestseller. Being also called the Apocalypse of John, it predicted the second coming of Jesus Christ and the Last Judgment, with the latter resulting in allocating all the people that lived on earth in heaven or hell. So, people anticipated the end of the world. It's worth noting that it was the most long-awaited event in the human history. People expected it to come in the year 1000, in the year 1100, and the year 1500 was not an exception. At that time, the Catholic Church started to support the idea of the upcoming apocalypse. Before, it only flooded the minds of the false prophets on the streets of medieval cities. The apocalypse was that party of the year that people usually start preparing for well in advance. Some set off on adventure. Others tried to win their immortal souls back by selling off their belongings to buy an indulgence, an official assurance of absolution. Normally, the number of absolved sins equals the number of seals on the indulgence. So now, think about this. You expect the apocalypse and four horsemen, four hellish creatures with which the world is supposed to end. It's the year 1500, but still nothing happens. Life goes on while the Catholic Church slowly breaks down under the weight of condemnation. This is how the European faith crisis began. An artist were the first to criticize the church. In Bosch's paintings, the monks feast, play musical instruments, pander to witches and charlatans, and sell indulgences, exceptionally expensive papers on the absolution of sins. The acolytes sank in indifference and sins instead of sailing people to God in a boat called church. Bosch pictured half animals, half nuns to claim, heresy rooted in church. There is a dark nun who reads a book, a monk who pours wine to a charlatan's patient, and a white pig in monk's robe who kisses a young man, slipping him an indulgence. One of the curious features the religious conscience of that time holds, the text of Holy Scripture was the starting point for any reasoning. So, everything that isn't the work of God is the work of the devil. Why is that so? As you know, the first sinners were not Adam and Eve. It was Lucifer who mired in pride and tried to take God's place. He raised a rebellion but was cast down with his army. The angels were falling into the center of the earth, the supposed hell. Some of them wanted to stay on the earth, but God turned them into insects doomed to torment the bodies of Eve and Adam till the end of times. That's where we find the answer to the question of why so many demons look like mosquitoes, lizards and insects. Look at these monsters. Do they look scary or maybe frighten you? Well, they apparently don't. But make no mistake, if Bosch wanted to scare you, he would definitely do it. Here he did the opposite thing. He made demons look weak and pathetic. Miserable half people, half animals depicted as sad and desperate. The viewer is more likely to laugh at them than get scared. A medieval belief helps us understand why these demons look so clownish. If one wants to beat a monster, they have to laugh at it. Bosch didn't mean to scare us. On the contrary, his goal was to make us laugh and fight the demons around us. And demons are everywhere, at the market, in a bar, or just wandering around the streets. They tempt the strangers, whispering in their ears. If a person is seduced by their words, they will find themselves on a straight and easy highway to hell. At the same time, 
The road to heaven is thorny and long since angels don't always follow the person. Now, let's focus on the way the characters are positioned. Initially, Lucifer is depicted upside down compared to God. Bosch used this feature in his works. Normally, being turned upside down, objects lose their original meaning and receive the opposite. Let's have a look at famous Bosch's charlatan. Instead of a hairdresser, he's wearing an inverted funnel. A jug filled with water is a symbol of a pure soul, but if we empty it and turn it upside down, it will become the symbol of heresy. An open book in the hands of a believer is the Holy Scripture, while the closed book on the head of a sinner means that they play act they follow the vows and commandments. In fact, the soul is already lost. When it comes to the placement of the characters, Bosch used another curious technique. For example, have a look at the Garden of Earthly Delights. There is a knob of people standing on their hands, with the upper body part being absorbed by plants. There is a theory that these images were inspired by the acrobats from traveling circuses popular in medieval Europe. However, if we keep in mind the altered meaning of the objects placed upside down, we will realize the images have a homosexual nature. Compared to ancient times, the medieval meaning of owls changed drastically. Before, the owl was a symbol of knowledge and wisdom. A medieval person knew the owl haunted at night, and therefore had a demonic nature. It embodied false knowledge and false wisdom, which came from the devil. In the Garden of Earthly Delights, a young man hugs the demon owl. It hides in the holy place, a sacred spring in heaven. It is reminiscent of Lucifer's rebellion. Heaven is poisoned by the seeds of evil. The first sin against God is always there. Bosch sank into the features of his time. He searched for inspiration in multiple books of visions, many of which were written by false prophets before the apocalypse. People also came up with stories about the afterlife and spread rumors across medieval cities. Thus, not all the monsters were created by Bosch. They were the figment of a collective mind. As I've already mentioned, in Bosch's paintings, monks and nuns have fun, play musical instruments, get drunk and pander to sorcerers instead of teaching the sinners how to find the right path. Bosch judged ordinary people who gave in to their sins. To illustrate his beliefs, he used an intriguing technique popular in the Middle Ages. If the person is ugly physically, their inner world is also ugly. Thus, when we see the grotesque faces in the crowd in Christ carrying the cross, we can conclude that their souls are lost. They argue, grin and fly off the handle. Looking at a collapsing house in the Wayfarer, we can easily recognize a brothel where the shady business takes place. Yet the greatest collection of human vices is portrayed in the Haywain triptych. The scientists couldn't grasp the meaning behind the haystack for a long time until they discovered an old Holland song. According to the lyrics, God gave people a blessing manifested in a haystack so they could allocate it in equal parts. However, People were selfish and everyone wanted to take the bigger piece. Have a look. People are so busy sinning and stealing that they don't even notice the haystack moves towards hell with the help of demonic creatures. In Dutch, the word hay has several meanings. In literal meaning, it is a straw. In figurative, something soulless, idle, perishable. This includes the material goods the characters of the triptych want so badly. This scene wasn't produced by the artist's mind only. Medieval Europe, and Schertoch and Bosch in particular, are known for local performances about morality. The actors try to show the sinners the path to God, remind them of the frailty of life and the imminent end. Berries were also an important symbol to understand Bosch and medieval people. One cannot ever eat enough berries, so it stands for worldly pleasures that don't save the immortal soul but make it sin. Nevertheless, everyone wants to eat a berry. There is an example in the Garden of Earthly Delights. Young men devour a huge strawberry, being not strong enough to resist the temptation. The power symbolism of the berries can be compared with musical instruments. At the turn of the 15th and 16th centuries, music ceased to be a church instrument only. It became secular, which enraged the righteous noblemen. They associated music with sins as it was played all around the streets or in bars. The rhythm of the music made people dance, which was the first stage of adultery, alcohol abuse and other horrors. The music was polyphonic, which means several instruments were playing at once. Quite often, Bosch is accused of eretism. 
he portrayed a variety of naked bodies, but let's keep in mind that in the Middle Ages, the body was devoid of sexual subtext. People were naked in heaven and in hell as well, because everyone faces God as they are. Makeup, wakes, and social status would not mean a thing. People look the way they are, the way nature and God created them. Bosch's life and personality are covered in mystery. There is a theory that there wasn't a single person, but the whole group of artists united under one name. But the same people say about Homer and Shakespeare. I guess we'll never know the truth. However, there is a late copy of his supposed self-portrait. If we agree that the artist looked like this, many characters of his paintings start to resemble him. A demon which doesn't let John the Apostle write the text of the Apocalypse has Bosch's face. Bosch also hides behind the face of the Traveler, pictured on the outer wings of the Haywain triptych. His face has the so-called alien from the Garden of Earthly Delights. Bosch criticized both the society he lived in and himself, preaching about his sinful nature. He also left a mark on each of his paintings. Everything we know about Bosch for sure we can pack in a couple of sentences. He was born around 1450. In 1481 he married a noble lady, and an excellent dowry allowed him not to care about their well-being. He was the only artist of illustrious brotherhood of our blessed lady, lived in Chertochenbosch and died in 1516. There is no data about whether Bosch gave names to his works or not. The researchers find it easier to give the paintings symbolic names, which help not to confuse the works. A single opinion about the number of paintings Bosch created. Now he is believed to create 25 works, but some of them lack his signature. Whether Bosch really tried to save people and show them the path to God, or he was engaged in heresy, magic and alchemy. The essence of Holland at the turn of the 15th and 16th centuries is pictured in his canvases. They fascinatingly combine religious teachings, knowledge of the world and the philosophy of the time. They also contain images of everyday life and culture based on local sayings, proverbs, jokes and popular folk characters living in a medieval city. There is a 500-year difference between us and one of the most mysterious artists of the Northern Renaissance. It might hinder the understanding, but we still can decipher some of his symbols and hidden meanings. To fully comprehend Bosch's hidden meanings carved in his paintings, we need to learn more contexts. To delve into the Middle Ages and understand the art of the time, join our course Medieval Europe, Plague, Gothic Style and Crusades. The link is in the description box.